Okay, good evening and welcome to Birkbeck Science Week. I'm Nick Keefe, I'm the Executive Dean for the School of Science. It's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to the presentations by the Department of Psychological Sciences. At 7 o'clock, Professor Nurse Derek Sharon will be talking about resilience in breast cancer. As you will have seen outside, there's some refreshments to be had between the two lectures and anybody is welcome to stay on for the second lecture, even if you haven't already booked. But first this evening, we have Dr. Lara Meister, who's going to be talking about investigating the self-presentation of body and mind. Lara is one of the newest recruits to the department, and she divides her time between Birkbeck and the Warburg Institute, just up, up the road near to where we're building our toddler lab. Lara did her PhD at Royal Holloway before joining us a couple of, couple of years ago, and I know from her talk that she did in her interview that it will give her an absolutely fascinating presentation this evening. So I'm very much looking forward to Lara talking about you really do you really know yourself? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. Oh sorry, I'll turn on the microphone so that will help. Can you all hear me now? Yeah. Thank you very much for coming and listening to this talk today. Um, as you can probably guess from the title, my main focus of research is the self. So today I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour of the self-representation, um, with a particular focus on the bodily self, so how we experience and perceive our own bodies. So in the first half of the talk, I'm going to be showing you some bodily illusions, um, which demonstrate that what we know about what is our body and what isn't our body is actually surprisingly malleable. In the second part of this um, talk, I'm going to um, talk about some new data we've got, a new project that we're currently running, um, this is focused on our mental representation of our own appearance. So hopefully, after that, you might be questioning whether you really have any idea what you look like at all. Okay, so given that this is a talk about the self, um, we can start with a really simple question. Who are you? So even though it's a simple question, there's obviously many different ways of answering this question. Um, one way, and probably the most common way, is to respond by listing a load of beliefs and knowledge you have about yourself. So if someone asks me, who am I? I could say, well, I'm Lara, I'm a lecturer in the psychology department, I live near Oxford, etc., etc." So all this is pulling information from what I'm going to term the conceptual self. So this is a rich, interconnected body of knowledge, beliefs, um, and associations with yourself. So I've used this word cloud just to kind of illustrate a little bit about the diverse types of information that can be contained within this self-representation. So it can contain things like your nationality, um, your occupation, um, skills, hobbies that you associate with yourselves, um, significant others, social roles, for example, if you're a mother, a daughter, a husband. Um, so a huge array of uh, semantic information within this uh, body of knowledge called the conceptual self. So we can contrast this to another way of answering this question. So instead of bursting forth with a load of knowledge about myself, if someone asked me who I was, I could just gesture to myself, well, this, what you see before you is you, this is my face, this is my body. So this is a more visual way of answering the question. And this is what we do on social networking sites, for example. So we post a profile picture of ourselves, and this is showing the world, this is me, this visual representation is me. And this I'm going to turn an aspect of the bodily self. Um, and you can see that it's quite different to the kind of verbal, uh, semantic information contained in the conceptual self. So at this point, it's worth pointing out that there are as many different definitions of different aspects of the self as there are people trying to define it. So this is one very broad way of defining different aspects of the self. Um, there are many other different ways of doing it. I think this is quite a useful distinction, um, but also I'd like you to keep this distinction in mind throughout the rest of the talk, um, because it becomes more relevant when we talk about the new project later on. So just to summarise, to be clear about what we're talking about here, the conceptual self contains beliefs, associations and feelings. So beliefs, importantly, don't have to be true. So I could believe that I'm a very trustworthy person, I could really hold that as part of my self-concept. 
I could, it could be that I've completely forgotten all the times that I've lied to get my own way, for example. So it doesn't have to be true, it's just that I believe it's true, it can be part of my self-concept. Associations can be things that we hold very strongly related to us, that define us in some way. So these can be significant others, for example, our children, our partners. It can be particular skills or hobbies that we feel really define us. Um, for some people, it might be their careers. I'm also including feelings in here. So these are slightly different to the other two types of information. Um, but these are kind of emotions that we hold towards ourselves. So this could also be labelled as self-esteem, how happy we are with ourselves. So this is in contrast to the bodily self. Um, and I'm going to focus more on the bodily self today because this is my kind of specific area of research. So the bodily self is primarily perceptual information. So this is information coming in from our senses, from vision, from touch, for example. Um, we can further uh, define this in two different aspects of the bodily self. One is body ownership, and the other is our representation of our physical appearance. So I'm going to go into more depth into these two things now. So we're going to start with ownership, because this one is a little bit harder to grasp, it's a little bit more abstract. Um, basically, it's the online current experience of your body as yours. So it's the feeling that you get when you look down at your body and know that it's yours. When you look at someone else's body, you know that it's not yours. So it's always present, this feeling of body ownership. And that's perhaps why it's kind of hard to focus on. It's not something that we ever think about in our everyday lives. It's based on multi-sensory and sensory motor inputs. So basically it's generated by um, sensations coming in from our vision, from our touch, and from our feeling of movement, and our brain's integration of those pieces of information. So we're going to go into more detail um, about how this works in a moment. On the other side, our representation of our appearance is a lot more easy to grasp. So this is basically a stored visual representation of our physical appearance, essentially a mental picture. So if you shut your eyes, you can all probably have some idea of what you look like. And this is what I'm talking about here, this visual representation. Okay. So we're going to look a bit more about ownership now, because it is a little bit hard to explain. Um, and I find with things that are always present, you often don't realise how important they are or understand what they are until they go wrong. Now, there's a very rare condition where ownership, body ownership does go wrong, and it's called somatic paraphrenia. So somatoparaphrenia um, results after brain damage, often to the right hemisphere, so normally after a stroke. Um, and it normally results in brain damage, um, results from brain damage to the right uh, temporal right junction and insula. Um, and it leads to the complete loss of normal body ownership over a certain limb, so normally the left arm or the left leg. And this loss of ownership is so traumatic and strange to the patient that they generally develop these quite florid delusions to explain this loss of this normal sensation. So various patients have been uh, described over the years um, to sort of um, explain this condition. So Muriel in 1996 um, described a patient who believed that their hand belonged to the doctor. So this patient had lost the normal sense of body ownership over their hand. And their brain was trying to make sense of this and develop this delusion that actually it wasn't their hand at all, it was the doctor's, he left it there. Levine in 1991 um, described a patient who believed her leg was her grandson's, who had visited earlier. And this is, I mean, it's really sort of fascinating for us to kind of hear about these situations. Um, but for the patients, this is really traumatic. So not only do they lose the normal sense of ownership over their limb, they often have very negative feelings towards that limb as well. They're very upset, they're very angry towards that limb. So this poor patient was always trying to push her leg out of the bed and like shouting for her grandson to come and pick it up because it wasn't, it wasn't hers, why did he leave it? Um, so really kind of quite traumatic experiences. So um, another patient believed that his hand belonged to another patient given to him by the doctor by mistake. So it was always on, on at the doctor saying, take it back, it's this guy's over there, it's not mine. So you can see that although it's a normal experience that we don't ever focus on in everyday life, um, this 
body ownership is really, really important for normal functioning. So if this is so important, what generates experience? What causes us to have this uh, feeling? Well, as I said before, it's based on multisensory and sensory motor inputs, so the sensations that are coming in from our sensory organs. And we can explain this a bit better if we imagine a case where we're looking in the mirror. Okay? So when we look in the mirror, we very rarely are completely motionless. We don't go and look in the mirror and just stare at ourselves. What we normally do is we move around. So we tilt our head, look at ourselves from different angles, we touch our face. Um, and importantly, when we move our head, we see our mirror image move their head at exactly the same time, exactly the same way. When we touch our cheek, we see our mirror image having their cheek touched and exactly the same place, exactly the same moment that we feel the touch. And it's these synchronies between different senses, between vision and touch in that example, um, that are integrated by the brain and that develops this feeling of um, uh, body ownership. So how do we know that these integrations of sensations lead to body ownership? Well, we know because if we mess about with these uh, sensations in simple experiments, we can actually induce people to lose ownership over part of their body and gain ownership, ownership over someone else's body. So some of you might have come across body illusions before. Um, if not, I'm just going to give you <laughs> a brief overview of the most uh, common of these called the rubber hand illusion. Okay, so in the rubber hand illusion, participants are seated at a desk. Um, their hand is placed on the desk, but importantly it's put out of their view, so it's hidden behind a partition. What they can actually see in front of them is a fake rubber hand. Now, the crucial uh, visuotactile stimulation is delivered by the experimenter. So what she does is she touches both the participant's real hand and the fake rubber hand in exactly the same way, in exactly the same time. And what happens is uh, the brain is feeling the touch on the participant's own hand, um, but seeing the touch on the fake rubber hand. And because these are synchronized, these two sensations, um, the brain integrates them, and this leads to a shift in ownership, to feel ownership over the fake rubber hand that you're looking at. Okay. So how do we know that this works? Well, the most common way of measuring this illusion is by getting subjective reports. So basically, we ask participants, how did that feel? Um, it's a little bit more well-controlled than that. So we have a, um, a sort of standardised questionnaire. Um, this is a bit small, so you might not be able to see it. But after experiencing the illusion, we find that people um, significantly agree with statements like, it seemed like I was looking directly at my own hand rather than at a rubber hand. It seemed that the rubber hand was part of my body. Um, it seemed that the rubber hand was my hand. It seemed that the rubber hand began to resemble my hand. Okay, so it, it does seem that this is associated with a genuine participant experience that they're feeling ownership over this fake non-self body part. So a subjective report is really good. It gives us kind of a rich measure of what someone is feeling. Um, but sometimes we want something a little bit more objective as well. So there are various more objective ways of measuring uh, shifts in ownership. So one of these is called proprioceptive drift. So here, you induce the illusion in a participant. They stay still, so with their hands still in the same place. You cover up both hands so they can't see anything. And you ask them to point to where they think the index finger of their real hand is, their real stimulated hand. Normally, we're quite good at this. So we generally know whereabouts in space our limbs are. This is proprioception. So if we haven't experienced any illusion, we're generally quite accurate. We go, OK, it's around there. After experiencing the illusion, people have a significant shift. So they actually think their real hand is positioned closer to the rubber hand than it was before. So this change in ownership has actually led to not only a sort of shift in what you think is your own body, but where you think your own body is. So it's really had quite a sort of striking effect on your bodily experience. A slightly more fun example is that we can also measure participants' reaction to the threat of the rubber hand. So after the rubber hand illusion, people tend to 
responds to the rubber hand being threatened as if it was their own hand being threatened. So if you just watch this video, it's really short, so just watch it carefully. I'm beginning to believe so this guy is experiencing oh, very slowly. <laughs> so then uh, it should be faster than that. Um, oh no, now it's stuck. That was that was the best video I had. Sorry about that. <laughs> Basically, what happens is. He's experiencing the rubber hand illusion. Begins to believe um, that this fake hand here is actually the part of his body. So that and then one someone is... lunges out with, I think it's a hammer, and <laughs> bashes the rubber hand. Um, and this guy, the participant, let me just see if I can get a still for you at least. Oh, it's a fall. <laughs> um, his body. So then. Okay, yeah. So you're not going to get a very good idea of the video, but he basically retract his hand really fast as if it was his own hand being threatened. Um, obviously this is kind of a fun example for YouTube, but we can actually sort of scientifically measure this. So we can measure their skin conductance response, which is essentially the sweat on your fingertips. And it's, a, it's an autonomic stress response that's very quickly elicited by a, a, a threat to our bodies. So after experiencing rubber hand illusion, people show a significantly raised skin conductance response if the rubber hand is threatened, as if it was their own hand. So not only do you experience the shift in ownership, you're actually trying to protect this new part of your body as if it was really yours. Okay. So that's the rubber hand illusion, and since that was developed, um, other illusions have developed that use exactly the same techniques, so the synchronised visuotactile stimulation, um, with other parts of the body. So, there's a facial analogue of the rubber hand illusion now called the enfacement illusion. And this is exactly the same idea. Um, instead of looking down at a fake hand, you're looking at someone else's face, either in real life or on a computer screen, for example. Um, and the person's face is being stroked with a combat or a paintbrush. At exactly the same time, your face is being stroked in exactly the same way. And this synchrony in the visual information and the tactile information on your cheek develops this really uncanny feeling that you're looking at yourself in the mirror but seeing someone else's face and it has similar effects on your body ownership. Since then there's also been quite nice developments to the whole body so um, with the use of some uh, head mounted display goggles and this visual tactile stimulation you can actually induce people to feel that they're standing behind themselves so they're actually almost having an out-of-body experience. So although this Stimulation is very, very simple and usually lasts about two minutes. It can induce really striking changes in experience in the body itself. Okay. So one final interesting thing about ownership is that it actually also influences the way we uh, represent our body's appearance, so what we think we look like. So, Previously, I was presenting these two things as distinct aspects of the body itself, but actually they're interlinked. So here's just a little bit of data to show that. So I'd like you just to focus on uh, these two first bars here. So what these people did was they induced the rubber hand illusion in one group of participants and did not induce the illusion in the other group. And they asked um, people to rate how similar they thought the rubber hand was to their own hand in terms of its visual appearance without looking at their own hand so their own hand was hidden. Um, so what they found in the group with, um, who didn't experience any illusion, um, they rated the rubber hand to look pretty dissimilar to their own hand. I mean if, if you see some of these rubber hands that different labs use, they're fairly rubbish. Um, they don't generally look very realistic. Um, however, the group that experienced the rubber hand illusion rated their own hands look much more similar to the uh, rubber hand than before. So this experience not only has changed their sense of ownership, but it's actually updated what they remember their own body to look like. So it just demonstrates that these different aspects of the body itself aren't quite as isolated as one might think. Okay, so why is this useful? Well, I think it's quite a useful uh, mechanism for keeping our bodily self up to date. So our bodies don't stay the same. They grow, they change as we age, for example. So some changes are quite slow, so ageing, um, becoming pregnant, um, gaining or losing weight. 
Other changes are quite rapid, so you could have a facial injury, for example. Um, you could accidentally shave off your eyebrow, which is apparently quite a common mishap according to the internet when I was researching the pictures for this slide. Um, you need some mechanism for your bodily self to maintain consistency and to keep up to date. So it seems quite sensible that this sense of ownership that's always there is constantly updating your visual representation of your physical appearance to keep you updated, to keep you current. Okay, so we focused mostly on ownership so far. Now I'm going to shift gear to um, looking a little bit more at this aspect of our appearance, so what we think we look like in our mind's eye. And now I'm going to talk about um, a new project that we're running, so I'm going to give you a brief overview of two experiments um, that investigate in more detail how accurate our mental picture is of our own uh, body's appearance um, and what might be influencing these mental pictures. Okay. So we could probably start this by having a little exercise. So I'd like you all to shut your eyes right now and I'd like you to try and bring into your mind a picture of your face. So just shut your eyes and just try to imagine what your face looks like. Just try to visualise it. Okay? Okay, so open your eyes now. Hands up who got a clear image of their own face. <laughs> One person. <laughs> um, that you could see that the scene, the sort of holistic uh, representation of your face, just like you would a photograph, I guess. Um, hands up if you kind of struggled, it was a bit fuzzy, you couldn't really bring it into your mind. Yeah, okay, most of you. Okay, one last question. Hands up, who has seen their face in a mirror at least once today? Yeah. So I would suspect almost 100% of you. So isn't that interesting that almost all of us see our face every day in the mirror at least once, yet almost all of us struggle with bringing our face into our mind? So let's try one more thing. What about our body shape? So if you want to, again, you can shut your eyes and just try to visualise what you look like in the mirror in terms of your full body. So again, some people, probably very few people, have a clear representation, a clear picture of your full body. Other people, me included, have a bit of a hazy representation, you might kind of have an idea about what various bits look like and not what others look like, or really how they fit together. So even those who feel that they did get a clear picture, I wonder how accurate you are. So it might be that some people have a very uh, photographic memory, um, and you might have a perfectly accurate representation of what you look like. Other people might manage to get a clear picture but this might be biased, skewed, it might have misperceptions about your actual appearance. And this is what our current project is trying to investigate in a bit more detail. So I think probably the obvious question now is, well, how on earth do you measure that? I'm getting you to shut your eyes and then put your hand up, but that's not exactly <laughs> very scientific here. Um, obviously, if we were all excellent photorealistic artists, I could get my group of participants and say, paint yourself, and then I could analyse their portraits. No, that would be perfect. Unfortunately, um, not many people have that skill. So how on earth do we measure what people's mental picture is of their own face or of their own body? Well, luckily, there is a computational task called reverse correlation um, that we can use to essentially get a printout of a mental picture from each of our participants' minds. Okay. So, this task is solely being used to get pictures of other people so far. Our project is the first to use it to get pictures of the self. Um, but just to show you examples of this task, I'll show you the examples of the other people first, and then I'll show you how we can use it in our project. So, reverse correlation is a psychological task involving the presentation of face stimuli that are blurry or noisy. So, if you're doing the task, you must choose face images that match best your mental picture of whatever type of person we're testing. The results allow us to visualise a participant's internal representation of a certain face or type of face. And as I said, it's previously only been used to visualise mental pictures of other people, but we can adapt it for our needs. 
So this is what the simile looks like. So different looking faces are made by putting random noise over an average base face. So for example, if we're generating male faces here, we've got this average male. Um, we overlay this randomly generated noise and it makes these noisy face images that just happen to have kind of different facial characteristics depending on the pattern of noise. And we make pairs of images. So this is um, the face that is the result of overlaying the noise onto the base face. This is the result of subtracting the noise from the base face. So you can see that, even though they're both kind of fuzzy and noisy, I don't know how well you can see it, um, you can see that they're kind of opposites. So the one on the left has quite deep sunken eyes, quite full lips, and the one on the right has lighter eye area and narrow lips. So each randomly generated pair of faces looks randomly different, but they're each kind of opposites of each other. So in each trial, participants are shown a random pair of images, and they have to choose which one matches their mental picture of whatever type of person um, the best. Now, participants have to complete many, many trials of this, so it's a, a little bit tedious for them, but, but they cope if we pay them. Um, <laughs> and so after doing the task, we take all the images that they chose, discard all the ones that they didn't choose, um, and we average them together to get the final picture. Okay. So this is essentially what the um, task would look like. Um, and you ask them to choose which one looks most trustworthy, for example, and then you get um, each participant's stereotypical image of a trustworthy face, or you can ask them which one looks most like a teacher, and you get their image of what a teacher looks like. So it's quite a kind of... Um, useful task for a lot of different questions. So I'll just show you a few examples of results that um, people have got from this task. So um, in one study, they wanted to investigate people's stereotypes, visual stereotypes of different occupations. So here, first they got participants to do this task and choose faces that look most like a manager. Okay? In the second task, they asked them to choose which ones look most like a nursery teacher. And here are the two results. So I don't think I need to tell you which one's which. I think you can probably imagine. Um, so as you probably guessed, that was the nursery teacher, and then of course that's the manager. Now this not only tells us that people have clear visual stereotypes, clear mental images of what different occupations look like, um, it also kind of gives us clues into their unconscious attitudes towards these different types of person. So what this specific study did, they got um, another group of individuals to rate each participant's images that they generated on warmth and competence. So as you would probably imagine, overall people's manager portraits were rated as highly competent but low in warmth, and it was the opposite for the nursery teacher. But what was interesting was it correlated with individual differences in associations. So if a certain participant had a super strong um, unconscious attitude towards managers being really, really competent people, um, they would generate a much more competent looking manager face. So not only can you get a printout of someone's mental image of a certain type of person, you kind of get these intriguing insights into what people feel and think and believe about that type of person as well. So it's been done with many different personality traits, different characteristics. And what's nice about it is that it shows that even though there are individual differences, um, people generally agree. So even if I muddled up these labels here, you could probably sort them out between yourself. You'd probably all agree that this face probably looks the most trustworthy. That one probably looks pretty untrustworthy and a complete monster, um, uh, etc. So there's quite a lot of consensus between individuals on these visual stereotypes. Uh, you might have seen this in the media recently. Um, so this was a paper published only about two weeks ago, so then there was a bit of a media flurry about it. Um, so a group in America asked 511 American Christians to do this task and choose faces that they thought looked most like God, which is kind of interesting. And this is God. <laughs> Meet God here. <laughs> um, so this is really interesting. Um, this is God. Some people think it looks like Elon Musk, the <laughs> CEO of Tesla. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll leave that for you to judge. What's interesting about the face of God was not only that this is what this guy looked like, um, 
but that there were individual differences in the pictures that were generated um, according to demographics. So African-American Christians generally generated a god that looked more African-American than Caucasian and vice versa for the white Christians. Um, they also found quite intriguing differences between liberals and conservatives. So liberals generally um, made a god look more benevolent, benevolent and kind, whereas conservatives generally generated a more powerful, dominant face as God. So, again, it's kind of revealing these quite intriguing um, differences in people's beliefs and attitudes, as well as their mental picture, their visualisation of certain types of person or deity. Okay, so how can we use this for our own ends? Well, as you could probably guess, we can ask people to choose which face out of each pair looks most like your own. So we can uh, match the gender of the faces we're showing to the gender of the participant. Um, and hopefully we get out a self-portrait. So I'm going to refer to it as a self-portrait for now because it's easier than the mouthful I was saying before. Um, so we can get a visual printout of someone's mental representation of their own facial appearance. So what were our research questions? Well, firstly, we wanted to find out how accurate people were. Do we really have any idea about what our face looks like? Um, if we're not accurate, what influences these inaccuracies? Are we always biased positively? Do we always visualise our face as being better looking and more beautiful than the reality? Um, so we want to kind of investigate both these two research questions. Specifically, we hypothesised that inaccuracies in our self-portrait might be associated with conceptual or emotional aspects of our self-representation. So this is going back to the big distinction that I made um, at the start between the conceptual self, these beliefs and associations and emotions to do with yourself, and the bodily self. So here we're hypothesising that, for example, people who believe that they are highly trustworthy people, they hold that as part of their self-concept, might believe, might uh, enhance the trustworthy features of their own self-portrait. So they might remember their own face as looking more trustworthy, the typical bigger eyes, more childlike features, slightly smiling face, um, than in reality. So that's what we're interested in. We wanted to see whether the beliefs about the self, this conceptual self-representation, was influencing uh, the bodily self in some way. So this is what we did in our first experiment. So our method, we used the reverse correlation task to get this measure of the bodily self to get these self-portraits for each participant. We also measured aspects of the conceptual self. So we used various different questionnaires for this. So we measured um, self-esteem to get how people felt about themselves. Um, we asked people to rate themselves on how trustworthy, dominant and attractive they thought they were. Um, we chose these three traits just because they have very clear links with facial features. So we all agree what a trustworthy face looks like versus an untrustworthy face and dominant, for example, has a big square jaw and a big heavy brow, so we all agree about this. We also got them to self-report on their personality traits by using the Big Five Personality Questionnaire. So this is a very widely used questionnaire, it gives us these um, five measures of personality traits. These are extroversion, agreeableness, uh, conscientiousness, neuroticism and openness. So we all got these self-reported traits from the participant, and these should be measures of the conceptual self. Importantly, we also got a measure of their real appearance, and this was really important to assess how accurate their self-portraits were. We needed to know what they really looked like. Okay. So in this experiment, we got 77 young adult participants, uh, 34 were male, and they completed the main experiment. To give us data to analyse, um, we then sent the um, real faces, their photographs, and also their self-portraits that they generated um, to a second group of independent raters. So we got personality and trait ratings for both self-portraits and the real photographs. So essentially we asked the second group of raters, how neurotic does this face look, how trustworthy does this face look, um, all the way through all our traits. So we had, by the end, all the personality trait ratings for the self-portraits, the real photographs, and the, the own participants' self-ratings of their personalities. Okay. 
We also wanted to calculate accuracy. So here we had quite an um, objective measure. So we used a um, face recognition software. Uh, I won't go into how it works because I don't entirely understand the mathematics of it. Um, essentially, it maps this, the face of the self-portrait. It maps 128 dimensions of the space um, and then compares them to the same 128 dimensions of the real face and compares distance between these parameters. Um, and it ends up with a sort of computational accuracy score that um, tells us how accurate each participant was in the mental representation of itself. So, our key questions. Firstly, we wanted to see whether the self-rating, so participants' aspects of their conceptual self, what they believe in terms of their personality traits, did they predict the traits of the self-portraits controlling for their real facial characteristics? So, for example, if someone thought they were very extroverted, so that was part of their self-concept, or I'm, you know, I'm a, the centre of every party, would they create a self-portrait that was rated as more extroverted by our external rate raters than their real face was in reality? We were also interested in what individual differences in accuracy related to. So if all you guys in this room did my experiments, we'd probably find that some of you were really awful at it, some of you were really good. Um, what is the difference between you two groups of people? One idea we had was that perhaps people with higher self-esteem might be generally more accurate. Or conversely, they might be more deluded, and that might be why they have high self-esteem. So it's kind of one of these open empirical questions. Okay, so what did we find? So just to recap, we wanted to see what predicted um, what this self-portrait looked like for each participant. I'm not going to go into the stats that we used. We fitted a linear mixed models um, analysis. Firstly, we found that features of the participant's real face significantly predicted the features of the self-portrait. Now, this isn't very exciting as it stands. Basically, what this is saying is that if a participant's real face looked very dominant, um, their self-portrait also probably looked quite dominant. And even though it's not exciting, it was quite nice to find because it just meant that we do have, in general, some idea of what we look like. We do have some semblance of accuracy of our self-portraits. What was more interesting was that even controlling for this relationship, we found a significant effect of participants' self-ratings of their own personality traits. So regardless of what they really looked like, if a participant, for example, believed that they're a very neurotic person, their self-portrait had neurotic features about them, um, controlling for how neurotic their real face looked like. So this was exactly what we'd hypothesised, that not only is the self-portrait quite accurate, those inaccuracies that are featured in the self-portrait are explained by more conceptual beliefs about the self. So it's like you've got a bit of a fuzzy picture about what you look like, so you colour it in with what you know about yourself. So you're like, oh, I kind of look like that, I can't really get a clear image. But I know I'm a really trustworthy person, so I must have big eyes and a big open face. Um, so this is a really interesting finding for us. And just to kind of give you a few examples, just to kind of make the finding a bit more clear, these are two real-life examples from participants for our, from our first experiment. So these are two self-portraits generated by different female individuals. Okay? So this one, you can see it's quite nice looking. Um, our external raters rated this face as quite attractive, agreeable, trustworthy. This one, on the other hand, was rated as much less attractive. Um, it was rated as having low agreeableness and quite untrustworthy. Now, the intriguing thing about these two faces is that they were generated by two women who looked very, very similar. Um, and their real faces were rated as very equal in terms of attractiveness, in terms of agreeableness, and all these other traits. So they are both quite attractive females. Um, so what was intriguing was what led these two similar-looking females to have such different mental representations of what they looked like. And what we found was that these two participants had very different levels of self-esteem and self-ratings of their own attractiveness and agreeableness. 
So the participant who generated this image had very low self-esteem. Um, she believed that she wasn't a very agreeable person, she was quite a neurotic person, she wasn't very trustworthy. And this is the picture that she had in her mind when she imagined herself. This person, on the other hand, even though she looked very similar to the other girl, she had high self-esteem, she was a confident person, she believed she was fairly attractive, she was an agreeable, extroverted person. So I think this is a really striking example of how beliefs and feelings about yourself can influence this bodily self-representation. Okay. So just to summarise what we found in the first experiment, we essentially found that the bodily self, our mental representation of our physical appearance, it's kind of coloured in, it's influenced by feelings and beliefs about ourselves that I've termed the conceptual self here. So, our second question was, what do individual differences in accuracy relate to? So what's the difference between you guys who might be like really, really accurate and other guys who have absolutely no idea what they look like? So here are a few other real life examples. Um, this girl, you can see, is pretty accurate. And so she scored quite highly when we inserted these into our um, face recognition software. Um, you can see that her self-portrait has identified you know, these kind of large eyes, the pursed lips. This guy, on the other hand, was fairly inaccurate. He, he didn't have much idea, did he? Um, ignoring the beard, so it doesn't take into account facial, sort of surface facial features. You can see that he's got quite close together, quite large eyes, um, and his self-portrait had narrow, fast, far apart eyes. Narrow lips here, full lips here. So this guy had no clue. And, <laughs> and actually, he's one of my colleagues who kind of did my experiment, so I could be rude about him. Um, but, um, but yeah, he was, he was fairly rubbish. So what's, what's the difference between these two people? What causes this? Well, we don't know yet, but one thing we found was that the higher the self-esteem, the more accurate the facial self-representation. So people who were very confident in themselves, and specifically people who had high social self-esteem, so were confident about themselves in social situations, um, tended to have much more accurate self-representations. Now, we don't know the sort of causality of this finding yet. Um, we don't know whether it's that people with high self-esteem don't need to kid themselves um, about their appearance. Um, there's lots of sort of alternative interpretations of this finding, so we need to investigate further with this one. Right, so we're almost at the end now. I'm just going to talk about, very briefly, one final experiment. Um, this is asking the same question, but in terms of the body shape. So we're leaving the faces behind and we're moving to the body. So, as I got you to imagine earlier on, um, some of you have a clear image of your body shape. Some of you have a less clear image. Um, we can measure this in exactly the same way using this reverse correlation paradigm. Now, as you can see from this, the stimuli aren't quite as visually pleasing as the faces. Um, in fact, they're really, really hard to discriminate. Um, I find it a bit of a challenge <coughs> to see the difference between these images. Um, participants did manage, we did have to pay more to, <laughs> for their suffering with this. Um, but essentially, the task was the same. So we asked participants to choose out of each pair of um, images, uh, which one looked most like their own body shape. Um, and so for this experiment, we only measured females. So what were our research questions? Well, they were the same as before. So how accurate are people's body self-portraits? And do inaccuracies re reflect biases associated with conceptual or emotional aspects of our self-representation, as we found with faces? So for this, we added one further task. So not only did we get people to choose which body looked most like their own in one version of the task to get this self-portrait of the body shape, um, we also asked people to do the task again um, and choose which body looked most typical or normal for someone of their age and gender. Because we were not only interested in how they perceived themselves, but also what they perceived was normal in terms of you know, their friends and their, their peers. Um, because we're a social species, a lot of our self-representation comes from social comparison. So um, that's why we asked this question. So for each participant, we've got a self-portrait, also an image of what they thought was normal. 
So the method was similar to before, so we measured their bodily self um, using the reverse correlation task. We measured their conceptual or emotional self, um, this time just focusing on body self-esteem. So this was um, getting at this kind of emotional, affective feelings towards the self, how happy you are with your body shape. And we also, again, measured their real appearance, this time just measuring their real bodies with the tape measure, um, because obviously we wanted to assess how accurate people were. So these are examples from a participant's images that came out. And again, they're pretty rubbish to look at. <laughs> uh, to, to the naked eye, there's not much difference between them. Um, I don't know, from far away you might be able to see that the self-image for this participant had a slightly rounder bum, larger hip area. Uh, the typical, the normal body might seem a little bit more straight up and down. Um, as you can see, it's not easy to see from the naked eye, so we didn't get a group of raters to rate how large or small these bodies were. Uh, we took a bit more of a sort of mathematical approach. Um, so I won't go into how we did this, but basically we uh, fitted psychometric functions to um, assess where the likely edge of the hips were in each image. So we focused on the hips area as a sort of region of interest. Um, because the size of the hips has been found in other studies to be quite closely related to bodily self-esteem. Um, so that was our area of interest, um, and we used this technique to just give us a hip width score for each image, for each participant. And again, um, we did the same analysis, because we have the same research questions. Um, we wanted to see what predicted the hip size of the self-portrait, first and foremost. And Quite nicely, we found that the primary predictor was the participants' bodily self-esteem, so how happy or sad they were about their, their body's appearance. Um, if they had a low self-esteem about their bodies, they generally had a mental image of themselves as larger. Also quite interestingly, um, bodily self-esteem predicted their mental image of what was typical or normal, and this was in the opposite direction. So let me just show you the scatter plots for this. So let's look at the first one first. So this is um, the relationship between body self-esteem and um, the width of the self-portrait in the hip region. And I put these smiley faces here just to show you that the low scores on the body, uh, body esteem scale are um, negative feelings about yourself and the high scores are positive. So for the self-representation, uh, you can see that uh, people with lower body self-esteem tend to uh, perceive their hips as larger and um, those that were more happy with their bodies tended to have a more slim mental picture of themselves. So this is in the direction that we look at. For the typical or normal body picture, um, it was precisely the opposite relationship. So people who were unhappy with their own bodies tended also to picture a normal body as narrower or slimmer than someone who was happier with their body. So this all kind of makes sense, it kind of goes along with our expectations. Quite intriguingly, and, and differently to the face experiment, we found that there was no relationship with reality here. So participants, the, the size of their mental picture when they shut their eyes and imagined their bodies, bore no resemblance to reality. And that's quite fascinating. So if this finding generalises to the wider world. If you're going out and pick up a, you know, going shopping, pick up a top and go, oh no, that would look awful on me, I can just imagine how big I'd look. It might be that your mental image of what you look like has no relationship to reality at all. And that's quite an interesting finding for us. Okay, so what are the next steps for this project? As, as you can see, it's early days. Um, so far, we've got correlational data. So the data that I've shown you shows that there is a relationship between the conceptual or emotional aspect of um, the self and our mental image, our, our sort of bodily self. So we know these two are related, but we don't know in what direction. So it might be that if we believe we're highly agreeable, it influences what our mental picture looks like in terms of agreeableness. Or it might actually be the other way. So it might be that if we have a very agreeable looking mental self-portrait, we actually believe that we are agreeable as a consequence of that. So we don't know the direction of the relationship yet, so that's one thing that we can investigate. 
And perhaps more interestingly, we can take this project to consider various different psychological disorders. So a number of different psychological disorders have as a key feature a misrepresentation or delusions regarding the self. So some very obvious key ones are body dysmorphic disorder, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, anorexia and other eating disorders, which are obviously um, associated with a misperception of fatness or thinness. Um, and also it'd be interesting to investigate personality disorders, given this link that we've found between the bodily self and perception of personality. So I'd like just to consider body dysmorphia just in a tiny bit more detail. So this is a mental disorder that's associated with a um, strong misrepresentation of the body's appearance um, that causes real strong distress. So these are just, sorry, it's a lot of text, but these are just a few quotes about body dysmorphia. So um, the first says, a person with body dysmorphia looks like everyone else, but they live inside a hallucination that shows them nothing but flaws. And now the, the second one is from a sufferer of body dysmorphia. I, on the other hand, have no idea what it actually looked like. The mirror is a source of constant, oh sorry, <laughs> constant something, surprise I think was the word, sorry I got missed off. Um, instead, the areas troubling me are literally all that I can see. Instead of my face, I see a cubist's portrait that's been ripped to shreds and then pieces rearranged and magnified. So from these quotes, you can see that there's quite a clear misrepresentation in terms of their self-portraits. Um, and so I think this project and this technique that we've developed would probably give us really fascinating insights into this um, group of uh, patients. Okay, so what have we learned today? Well, I'm hoping that you've learned that our mental pictures of our appearance are not as accurate as we might think, unless we happen to have really high self-esteem. They are biased and coloured in by beliefs and feelings we have about ourselves, and this is why I'm telling the, the conceptual self. And this might give us fascinating insights into disorders like body dysmorphia, eating disorders and personality disorders. And so if you, if you remember anything from this talk, um, Quite likely to remember that the self is not a unitary construct, so it can include representations of the body as well as the mind, so the body is what I work on. Um, our representations of our body are flexible, easily changed and often inaccurate, so we saw that from the um, bodily illusions that even just a minor change in sensory stimulation can actually change the way you respond to threats, the way, way you think your body is in the world, so it's quite striking the effect of this. Body and mind aspects of self seem to interact, so they're not isolated. Um, and this is probably to provide us with a more integrated, holistic experience of the self as a whole. Okay, and that's it. So I'd like to thank um, uh, Professor Sakura Sinongo, who worked on this project, and also um, Sophie, my research assistant, who uh, gathered a lot of the data. So thank you very much for listening. I'm sure there'll be several questions. Without permission, I have taken so much there for talk. Can I keep it there now? Yeah, that's fine with me, unless there's another reason why. You know? <laughs> yeah. Can you the back? Yeah, I was wondering in terms of um, people with, with um, low self esteem, did you come across, um, or did you test for that in terms of um, them having like an ideal perception of how they? Look yeah, no, and that would be really fascinating. So we tried to get at it, we sort of half got at it with the body experiment when we asked them to um, uh, visualise what was normal. But you're right, I think that would be a really interesting extension to get people to um, generate their, their optimal self. Because everyone's optimal self is going to be different depending on what, what they value and you know, different uh, individual differences. So that's actually a really fascinating idea for the next study. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to mention something that I once saw in a film about anorexia mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. And was, whilst you've been talking about representations of self and like what people see and how, they, or how we can imagine what we see, I mean, a lot, lots of things obviously come together in that. Um, but this was where people in a hospital in, were facing a mirror, anorexics facing a mirror, 
and they should draw around the outline of their body. Mm -hmm. Now you think, well, you can't make a mistake about that because you're standing a foot away from the mirror and you can see it in the, and all of them drew yeah. somebody twice the size of them, not twice. Yeah. You know, much bigger than them. Yeah. Even though they were standing there and their body was there and then the, the line they drew was outside. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's a really interesting point. So with our tasks, we're measuring people's memory of yeah. what they look like. Um, and I think anorexia is a really interesting one because it seems like they have, as well as a, a distorted memory of what they look like, they actually have distorted perception, online yeah. perception, yeah. current perception as well. And that would be really interesting to investigate with the body dysmorphia. Um, I think part of it is attentional processing. Um, so they're choosing features to attend to more than others at the detriment of others. Um, but with that, that example, it's really striking because you... I mean, we can't understand how they could misperceive something that's directly in front of them. So yeah, that's, that's something to kind of consider Yeah, when we take it to the clinical disorders. It's interesting. Yeah, um, yeah um, thank you for your talk. Um, earlier you said something about how one's belief that she could be trustworthy could be a false belief, mm -hmm. yet a sincere belief. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering how you think self-deception plays a role in the co correlation between uh, self-conception and then the actual identity of, uh, I mean the actual person. So yeah. self-deception, self-conception, and then the actual person is. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So obviously we use our personality measures and our trait measures as, as just a self-report. So we wanted to just get people's idea of what they were like, not truly what they were like. Um, I guess to get at their true traits, uh, we would have to get um, their friends or family to report on them. So um, I think people in personality research have done that and you can see discrepancies between what you think you're like and what you truly are like and talk to other people. Um, but that's a really interesting focus, I think, and um, definitely something that we can delve into a little bit more. Yeah. What percentage of people really came up with a more attractive picture than the, the absolute score? Gosh, that's a good question. I haven't actually looked. Yeah, so that, that, that was something I was thinking of when we were trying to interpret the high self-esteem equals higher accuracy. Um, because we took into account all the different personality traits, um, a few, not very many, but a few of which were negative, like neur neuroticism, um, it wasn't the case that people just uh, self, what's the word? made themselves better. Um, there was variations in terms in the negative direction as well, but yeah, I'm not sure about proportions. Given that we're, we're quite sort of self-serving creatures in general, we're quite egocentric and we have these positive biases, so I would suspect it would be the majority, but yeah, I should look at that. Yeah? Well, what's the best theory of, that we explain the uh, constantly question that we put the outset, which is glasses have our, think of our own bodies mm -hmm. and our faces, and most people have no idea, I don't even know, or pretty vague notion. Why is it so vague? That's a good question, and I don't know. Yeah, and, it's, and that's what I found fascinating, was because we have accurate updating information presented to us every day when we see ourselves in the mirror and even when we look down at our own bodies, yet we can't visualise it. And, and I think we have possibly, I think we're possibly more successful visualising other people's faces than we are our own. Um, so yeah, I think that's partly why I'm fascinated in this topic to begin with, I, I don't know, so um, yeah, that's definitely something to be, to be answered. Um, when you, the, the stabbing of the hand, yes. would you think about, when you, so you, as, you, as you continue, would you think about the um, empathy process. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because you mirror, you know, the empathy, you know, mirror neurons. Yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting individual difference that does influence a lot of this body ownership stuff. Um, so there has been, it's been sort of variably replicated, but there's um, been studies that have identified that people who score higher on empathy measures um, have a more flexible self-representation, so they experience bodily illusions more strongly and they shift their ownership more strongly. Um, there's also various um, other tasks uh, measuring sort of 
uh, motor resonance with another person's pain, um, and, and that's certainly linked with uh, individual differences in empathy. So yeah, that, that's quite an um, interesting feature that, that comes up a lot in the body ownership literature. Um, that would also be interesting to look at in terms of the visual appearance representation as well, so we've not considered that yet. But yeah, that's definitely um, highly important with the, the sort of sensory motor vision like the resonance yeah. stuff. <coughs> Okay, I'd like to thank Laura again and invite you to come outside for a drink and, a, and a, something to eat.